Now that we have good sound, do I need to have move that over here close? Uh, I can move it a little closer, but uh, nobody in the chat has said if, if there's any audio issues, so I think so we're good. Excellent. You okay. hit him. Mm -hmm. Let me get my little thing up top to kind of go away. There it goes. All right, we're good to go. We're good to go. Well, yeah. good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Cesar Roca. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Alabama Orthopedic Clinic. I'm the board of directors of our, of our clinic, and it's a uh, pleasure being here with you guys this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, rotator cuff injury. It, so I love this quote. I used to think it was Mark Twain's, but yesterday when I was researching it, I found out that Mark Twain kind of got it from Confucius, uh, the uh, phil Chinese philosopher. Find a job that you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. And I can tell you, this is another quote, I absolutely love what I do. I have found a job that I absolutely love to do and I've been doing this for 31 years, and I absolutely love orthopedic surgery. I love the shoulder surgery. My practice has evolved from a general practice to, to mostly shoulder surgery, and it's the most rewarding thing. I'm a very blessed person. I, I it's a, Patients come to me with a problem that's most of the time very specific. Most of the time I can do something about it. Most of the time it's a good result as opposed to some of the things in medicine like, you know, can't cure cancer, can't cure diabetes, can't cure hypertension. You can palliate it. You can make them feel a little bit better. I have the, the pleasure and blessing to say that I can fix things, and I love to fix things, and I absolutely love what I do. Um, I'm very blessed also that I work with an amazing group of people at Alabama, Alabama Orthopedic Clinic. Everyone from the janitor to our CEO is committed to the wellness of our patients. And very few places you can say that you love going to work and you're working with a bunch of good people who are working with you uh, with the same mission. And I am just absolutely, absolutely blessed. Besides surgery, this is another one of my passions. Now, last night, I almost got in trouble because my wife said, when my wife was looking through my slides, she goes, so, it's big surgery and sail oh, sailing with my wife. <laughs> That's my second passion, sailing with my wife. So if you see Dr. Teresa Roca, say, well, your husband loves sailing with you. <laughs> so anyway, so before we go into uh, rotero cuff injuries, um, I have to get, tell you a little bit about the shoulder anatomy because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, in the hip, for instance, you have a very specific so, uh, socket and a very specific ball, and the, the acetabulum in the hip captures the the hip, the, the socket uh, captures the head of the of the of the femur. That's not the case with the shoulder. The shoulder you have you have the humeral head, and the socket, the glenoid, is very very shallow. So what keeps these structures together uh, is do you have a pointer with this or not? Uh, uh, I don't believe sorry, yeah. so. No, that's okay. So, um, so on the right side you have you have the the radiographs of, of the shoulder, and as you can see, the the head is in very intimate relationship with that with that very shallow socket. But what holds that together uh, is soft tissue. And the majority of that soft tissue is called the rotator cuff. So imagine if my the palm of my hand is the socket, and the, my fist is the, is the humeral head. So my fingers grabbing that together, that is your rotator cuff. So it's composed of essentially four, four tendons. And that's exactly what I imagine those, those tendons as I explained, grabbing that head, that is what stabilizes the rotator cuff. So before I go into causes of rotator cuff injury, Obviously, I have to tell you, well, how do I know what's going on? What, how do I know if I'm having a rotator cuff problem? So typically, the presentation is a, a patient is going to start sometimes insidiously de developing some discomfort. That's why I have normal degeneration is the, the, is the, main, the main problem. Think of it as um, a normal aging process. 
So no one has any problem accepting wrinkles or gray hair, or at least most people don't. <laughs> and uh, rotator cuff, think of it as a normal degeneration of tissue. So you haven't done anything. Patients sometimes come to my clinic, say, I didn't do anything. It just suddenly started hurting. I started having problems sleeping at night, reaching for things, combing my hair, getting that cup of coffee from Starbucks. Uh, and so what's going on? I didn't do anything wrong. Well, it's because there's a normal process of degeneration and you're going to start feeling some soreness, particularly with reaching, with reaching overhead, et cetera, sleeping on that, on that particular shoulder, uh, uh, reaching for objects, uh, sleeping on your stomach, et cetera, et cetera. So slow, insidious, you know, very slow process of pain that just will not go away. So on top of that, some people will be more prone to developing it than others. So genetics plays a, a course, uh, a part in this, in, this, in this situation. For instance, the, um, um, in this slide, see that structure called the acromion? There are three types, just like people have blue eyes, green eyes, gray eyes. It's just a normal uh, anatomical variant. And some people have a flat acromion, which they're very lucky. Some people have a type three acromion, which points down towards that rotator cuff and can easily impinge upon that rotator cuff, particularly when you're doing overhead repetitive activity. So genetics, of course, some people have collagen that's more likely to you not know, be as strong as others, uh, but occupational and recreational repetitive overhead activity. People, for instance, that work in an industry that requires reaching up, like changing light bulbs, electricians, painters, uh, people who are you know, building a ship, et cetera, et cetera. And when I take, tell patients repetitive overhead activity, sometimes you have to be careful what you mean by that. Obviously, overhead activity is obvious when you're standing. But if you're someone who is reaching horizontally, a mechanic who's reaching into the hood of a car, uh, a person who's working at a laundry who's reaching and moving uh, laundry around a table, that may not be, they may not be overhead, but they're reaching in relationship to their body, the elbow is higher than the shoulder, so that repetitive impingement can cause uh, irritation of the rotator cuff. And of course, trauma, someone falling directly on their shoulder, they fall on the side, that the trauma that can completely tear off that, those tendons away from that bone, can direct trauma, someone who dislocates their shoulder, particularly if you're older. So a younger person, is going to stretch the structures of the glenohumeral joint, but it's, but, but it's not going to tear the rotator cuff. But as you get older, the trauma can, can definitely cause a, a complete tearing of the rotator cuff. I have a lady who is a, um, uh, work, uh, works at the Spring Hill Hospital, an older lady, she fell and completely tore almost 90% of that rotator cuff through that dislocation. Now, if someone is working, uh, and a scaffolding, for instance, and grabs it and falls and grabs, so they can tear the labrum or they can take the, tear the rotator cuff. So, so again, you can have a rotator cuff tendonitis, injury, trauma, just by normal living, or you or just by doing certain activities like playing tennis and throwing a baseball, or just being a painter, or just you, you're lucky and you're unlucky and you fall on your boat on the weekend. So. Um, that like, like everything else in life, there is, there is a spectrum, okay? So you can have just a little bit of soreness, a little bit of transient inflammation, and if the transient inflammation continues, then it becomes a tendonitis. The tendonitis is just a fancy word for saying just an inflamed, swollen tendon. And the problem with that is that if you notice here in this, in this picture, you have Remember, you have the acromion and the humeral head, right? And then there's a finite space between that acromion. At the end of that, you see the, 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 the clavicle. At the end of the clavicle is the acromion, which is part of the scapula. And then you have the humeral head. Well, between those two bones, that's where you have the rotator cuff, especially the supraspinatus tendon. So imagine there's a finite space, and if that tendon becomes injured or inflamed, then by virtue of that inflammation, it's going to be thicker. So since it's thicker, when you move that shoulder, it's gonna pinch even more. It becomes a vicious cycle. Once, once it starts, it's going to progress if you don't address it. So 
Transient inflammation can become tendonitis. The tendonitis, the thickness of the tendon within that finite space, then can eventually become a partial tear, and there can be a larger tear, then a massive tear. And when you have complete damage and complete massive tearing of the rotator cuff, then you develop this tremendous, horrible arthritis that we call rotator cuff arthropathy. So it's a, it's a process, and you start from very benign little soreness to completely horrible arthritis. So here we go. So that's what I was uh, alluding to. You have the tissue between the two bones, and that becomes inflamed. As it becomes thicker, then it becomes impinged, and it becomes torn. So, that, so this little inflammation can lead to that rotator cuff tear. It can be partial, and then it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. This will be an example. This is actually one of my patients. Uh, as the, uh, the tissue, uh, where you can see clearly here, it's representing a, a complete tear. But imagine the, su the surface, the superior surface of that, of that uh, tendon becomes abraded by the bone that I talked about, the chromium right above it, and it eventually becomes abraded. And this is me probing it. It's not supposed to be fuzzy like this. It's supposed to be like a nice, beautiful, shiny tendon. And then this I've actually cleaned up some of that tissue, and you can see has all degenerated. That's not supposed to be fluff, fluffy like that. It's, 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 that tissue is essentially dead. It's just it's there, and, and you, sometimes you can see it on an MRI that well, yeah, there's some tissue there, but the tissue is just completely degenerated and terrible. So when I see this in surgery, I have to clean that out to get to healthy tissue so I can, so, I can, so, so the patient can heal better. And then you can have this is a tear. You can see there in the center, that's the humeral head, and that dark hole back there, that's actually the socket. So that tendon has completely detached from the humeral head, and it's now retracting. So that's the other concept, as I was explaining. It's a, it's a gradual process, right? So once you get to the point of tearing, think of the rotator cuff tendons as being a large rubber band. And when you when you nick that rubber band, it's going to tear. It's going to continue to run and run and run and run. So it's it's better to take care of these patients early. Otherwise, it's going to be a small problem can become something like this. This could be if you neglect that. If you some patients are tough and and just want to wait or just can't because of economic reasons or whatever. But if the fact is, it's going to get worse. And this is the sample of rotorocope arthropathy. So let me go back again through that spectrum. A little bit there. First, imagine just not fuzzy, but inflamed and angry, and then it becomes partial tear, then a full tear. And when this is neglected, you have this horrible thing where it's actually one of my patients that did a shoulder replacement on this guy. So there's no longer tissue between the humeral head and the acromion. And now if you notice the bone above it is starting to scallop, well, that, was, that used to be flat. And the bottom of the humeral head used to be a centimeter or a centimeter and a half lower. So there's nothing between those two bones. Horrible pain. He's deforming. He's creating almost like a hip. Um, did I do something? No, that just kind of popped up. Okay. <laughs> so this is a very painful shoulder. Uh, some of these patients actually have something we call pseudo paralysis because there's no tissue connecting to the humeral head they cannot move the shoulder more, more than 45 degrees. So they may be able to raise it up, but as you can imagine it's painful, it's crunchy, they can't get to their nose, they can't get to the hair, women can't get to the bra. Uh, it, it's just very incapacitating condition. So um, what do I do? He may have, he may have been last at the screen. Okay. Is so. that the slide that you were looking for? There we go. Oh. So next. <laughs> So what do I do to prevent that injury? If, I, if, we, if, if you remember absolutely nothing whatsoever from this lecture, because I give you a lot of information, if, if the one pearl that I want everyone to remember is don't put it off, okay? The best way to treat this is early diagnosis. I only operate on one person out of 10 that comes to my office. Sometimes patients want to avoid going to the orthopedic surgeon's office because, oh, he's a surgeon, he's going to cut on me. I only operate on the 10th ten, ten of the people that come to the office. I do a lot of this discussions uh, in my office because if, you, if I can prevent it, it's a lot easier than having to go through rehab, et cetera, et cetera. So early diagnosis, you start having pain. The pain, 
granted, you have pain for three days and it gets better. You exercise, you go to the gym, feel a little sore. You know that's going to hurt for a couple of days and it gets better going. Go on. If it's lingering more than a week or two, don't play. You got to just go look into it because early is easy. Early is easy. Anti-inflammatory medicines work wonders. Uh, some specific rotator cuff exercises. Patients always want to get a steroid shot. The trend on modern orthopedics is to get away from injections because think about it. Why are you hurting? That's God's way of telling you not to sleep on that shoulder, not to move in that direction, okay? So you get a shot, you decrease the inflammation, but the process is still there, right? That alarm system that your body gave you, it has been, it has been nullified. So you have to respect those signals your body is giving you. But not only that, studies have shown that steroids actually inhibit the healing cells that are trying to get you better. So just so people get, you know, I've had patients get really mad at me because I won't give them a shot of the help or something. It's because in the long run, if you do that, it just, just steroid injections in the long run are detrimental. But anti-inflammatory medicines orally, specific rotator cuff exercises at home and through physical therapy are great. Now, when I send someone to physical therapy, I think of it like a coach. My aim when I send someone to therapy is to understand exactly what to do and what not to do. Because very frequently someone will tell me, I'm a construction worker, I work at a shipyard, I'm exercising all day long, I can't get any more exercise. You, you can move it wrong. You have to be very specific on, for instance, if, if I'm just doing bench press and my belly's sticking out, I'm not doing anything for my abs, right? So you can say, I'll just be some active, my abs. No, your abs are not getting worked on, right? You, you, you're walking up and down stairs and lip, picking up things from the floor that's not doing specific rotator cuff strength exercises. So it's very, very important for you to understand exactly how to do it. And my aim is for a patient not to stay in physical therapy forever or come see me every week. I want them to get better and to get better on their own, to understand how to do their exercises so that the rotator cuff doesn't get injured so they can take care of themselves and continue on with their lives. So another one, like I, like I explained before, avoidance of repetitive overhead activity. If that rep repetition is painful, don't keep going there. Change your angles. Step on a ladder. Step on a stool. Bring a cup of sugar down here. Whatever it is that you have to at work, bring it. Don't keep going up there. If it's hurting you, it's your body telling you don't go there. And another thing that can happen is uh, abrupt movements. So many times. People will do, just jerk on something, grab, grab a tire or toss a, a garbage bag over a bin, uh, something that's quick and jerky, particularly if you're out of shape. If you're in good if you're, if you're in shape, you've been doing exercises and you do something abruptly, well, your body's there to help you. But if you haven't been exercising, suddenly you toss you know, the, the garbage bag over a bin or pull on, a, on something in the yard, yeah, your muscles are not going to be there, and you're going to hurt, and you're going to come see me. So, um, so when the um, conservative approach has not been successful, then we're thinking about, well, how do you how do you treat it if it's if if it's torn and you can't get it better by exercises, particularly if you already have a full thickness uh, retracted tear of the rotator cuff. Our first uh, line of treatment is uh, arthroscopy. It's just an amazing, wonderful tool. It has evolved over the 31 years that I've been in practice. The instruments, the, uh, the implants, the sutures, the, the videos, I mean, just absolutely amazing. What's really cool about this is that um, you make little bitty incisions to poke through the muscle. You're not cutting the muscle, the deltoid or the skin, which you have to call the skin, but you just poke through the deltoid to get to the pathology. Like, think of it like back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have, if you had a appendectomy, you had to cut through the skin, cut through the muscle, separate that tissue, get in there, and then, then, then repair healthy tissue that you had to cut to get to the pathology. We don't do that. We just make poke little bitty holes, and it's a, it's a great video game. It's just not a very good picture, but it's really awesome. I mean, here I am standing. If you can see, there's a screen behind my head, and I'm looking at another screen up across from me, and I'm just playing a video game, and it's just really, really cool. So I have fun, and I fix patients. So. Now, if you have a small tear uh, or partial tears, like I showed you on the previous uh, slide,
slide, a partial tear, I can clean it up, get the healthy tissue, small tear, we can just, can be very simple. You put a couple of little sutures, get, and you approximate healthy tissue to healthy tissue. This is a beautiful tissue, it has nice blood to it, that means it's alive. That partial tear that I showed you earlier looked pale and yellow, and you have to kind of get to this, so this healthy tissue can heal to itself. And as the tears get bigger, like this one, then I take this tissue and bring it back to where it belongs, I put these fancy stitches, and uh, it's funny because I mean, over in our surgery center, they call it the Roca stitch because I figure out a way to keep it from buckling, et cetera. But anyway, this is, this is really you know, just very pretty how you go from this big hole to that, and that's nice, healthy, thick, healthy tissue. And it can get bigger and, you know, a larger, uh, with larger tears, then we have, you know, so you, you look how big this thing is, you can't even, Sometimes you go and go, is, can we fix this? And there's, there are various different patterns and fancy ways of fixing it. And yeah, we can fix something huge like that into something that is controllable. Um, this is just so cool. This is just, it's so satisfying going from this, it goes like a cherry bomb went into it. So it's suddenly go, yep, yep, I'm the man. I got it, get it. <laughs> it is really so much fun. This is, uh, it's great surgery. Uh, and it's very satisfying. So um, look at this. This is a pretty complicated one where we had an L-shaped tear, and just, uh, we had three sides to sides on, on the on the left on the, on the left side, and then a couple of anchors on the on the right side. And uh, it's just now one thing about a large tear. Again, going back to prevention is the way to go because if you don't have to have surgery, obviously that's great. But if you can, if you had to have surgery. If you have surgery early, then I have healthy tissue that I can put together. As st statistics have shown, the larger the tear, the longer it's been neglected, the longer it has degenerated, then the tissue is not going to heal quite as readily and you have a very chance of it failing. A larger tear has a 30 to 50% chance of re-tearing within three to five years. But it's, it's a logical thing. If I'm putting suture through very thick, healthy tissue, as opposed to putting suture through a tissue paper, then what's going to hold? And, then, and you have to have circulation. So if you wait too long, I may not be able to fix it. And something that was actually quite revealing, uh, one of my partners sent me a patient. That patient was diagnosed in November, and she waited and she waited and came in March. So figure, okay, four months, that's not so bad. He went from a one centimeter tear to something that I just showed you, this horrible, big, large tear that uh, I fixed it, but you worry about the quality of that tissue. So not everybody is going to progress that quickly. Some research papers say you can tell a patient they can wait a year. I don't believe that. I think you should not wait 12 months to attend to this because I don't have the tissue and it's not going to work quite as well as if you attended early. So if you have a massive rotator cuff tear, obviously we can try to do it arthroscopically. Sometimes they're so large that you can't, and sometimes there will be tissue missing on the superior aspect, literally cannot put the two ends together. And there's some, then we have to do a, a, a smaller, it's like a three or four centimeter incision. And I do something called superior capsular reconstruction. There's no tendon or muscle on the top of the rotator cuff. And uh, the two ways that we do it is using a, a patch of cadaver skin to bridge that gap. But my favorite way of doing it is to use the person's biceps tendon, and I close that hole with a with a biceps tendon. But sometimes these patients have both a massive rotator cuff tear and the biceps tendon is gone, so I don't have that luxury. So this is what it would look like. I, I would basically take that that square piece or rectangular piece of, uh, of cadaver skin to bridge the gap, and it helps with pain. Uh, but I tell patients to just, they probably won't have much more shoulder elevation, much more than maybe 90 to 100 degrees. But when I do this, when I take the biceps tendon and bridge that gap, I've had some super amazing results. It's something about your own tissue. But I mean, it's, uh, but still, this is not um, going to be as perfect as having your own, your, your normal rotator cuff that I can fix. This is a, a 
temporizing maneuver because eventually you're going to have to have a shoulder replacement. So in a, in a per, an older person, and older is starting to get younger, um, so someone 65-ish, uh, we, we start thinking about doing a reverse shoulder replacement. So what is a reverse shoulder replacement? To have an, this is an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. So for an anatomic shoulder replacement, just like the principle that I explained before, you have the ball, you have the socket, to keep that relationship between the head of the humerus and the glenoid, the socket, you have to have something holding that together. That's the rotator cuff. So if someone has, this person just had um, uh, osteoarthritis, you know, the surfaces of the humeral head and the glenoid were very worn out, and you shave the glenoid, the, humor, the, the socket, you put a little plastic socket there, and then this beautiful metal head, and then they do great. But you have to have a rotator cuff. So this is a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. It's reversed because we put the socket where the head used to be, and we put a half a sphere where the socket used to be. So we, we reverse the socket on the ball. So this group in France discovered about 30, 40 years ago that, that by working with the geometry of the, of the shoulder, uh, what holds this together is the tension of the deltoid. The deltoid is the big muscles that go from the clavicle down to the humeral humerus. And so you're using, you're using the, 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 um, the deltoid as the stabilizing muscular forces. And uh, this is just a beautiful addition to our armamentarium and, and shoulder surgery. Because before we had this, you know, 25 years ago, we've been doing this particular surgery about 20 years now, but before that, it was uh, American doctors were very skeptical and you have to wait the results. And now it's just a panacea. Before 25, 30 years ago, patient with a ter terrible uh, uh, arthropathy like that, you, can, you could not move it. We cleaned them, we put the implants, but they were very unstable, very unhappy people. These patients can start moving immediately, and they start. They're just so 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 happy because you can start. I mean, we used to tell patients you can only have about 90 degrees of abduction and elevation. I have patients that you can't even tell they had anything wrong with them anymore. It's just amazing. It's just a, it's an absolute blessing to orthopedics and patients. Um, so the post-operative. What about if you have surgery? Uh, how long does it take for me to get back to work, doc? You know, I have. Yeah, I own my own company. I have. I have five children to feed. I can't take off. That's why I haven't been here for three years. And well, your rehab depends on your condition. So for those people who tell me they're just very responsible adults, they have. They can't take off from work. Well, get to me early because if you get to me early, I can just do exercises and medicine, avoid surgery. But if you have to have surgery and uh, you're not quite torn but you don't quite have a partial tear that needs to be completed, you can start, and therapy has not been successful, we can start with a, a, some acromal decompression, cleaning up scar tissue and uh, bone spur in the shoulder, and you can actually have some pretty good motion almost immediately, and you can have very good function within a couple of weeks. So if you don't wait too long, you can actually have pretty quick surgery. Of course, everything is, has to do also with the patient's spirit, and if someone wants to get better, they're going to get better, no matter what I put in there. You know, so if you get to me early and you really have a lot of responsibilities, get get there, and the surgery will be very simple, very quick. Now, if you have to have a complete rotator cuff repair, that's where things get a little bit stickier for some people who can't take that much time off. But you have to allow the repair six weeks. Uh, uh, to, to heal, just like you break a bone, you have to have a cast for six weeks, you have to mobilize it for six weeks. So you cannot move your shoulder actively, but there's some exercises that I show patients that so they can do passively. Now, cannot drive for six weeks, it's not safe to drive for, with, a, with, a, with one arm, but some patients can answer the phone, type, you know, go, go to do uh, inspections, et cetera, et cetera. So that six weeks of immobilization doesn't necessarily mean you have to stay home for six weeks depending upon your activity. Obviously, if you work building ships or you're an overhead electrician, you can't do that. But if you can 
if you can work from home, if you can work on your computer, you can do accounting, uh, uh, counseling, et cetera, et cetera, you can get back to work within two weeks. So if you have, if you have a more active, more active occupation, you have to allow six weeks to heal. Then at six weeks, we do outpatient physical therapy. Most patients can be very, very functional by three to four months, but it also depends upon the degree of your tear. If your tear is a fairly simple tear, chances are by three months you're going to be doing this. You may have some aches and pains, et cetera, et cetera, but you can function. And, but you have to be very careful for 12 months. The MRI studies have shown that you're not completely healed for a whole year. So I've had so many patients that I just, I got to go back to work. I, have, I respect that, completely respect that. You cannot respect someone. You have to respect someone who wants to get back to work as soon as possible. But I've had so many patients that went back to work at three months, four months, or doing stuff that I didn't tell them to do. And next thing you know, they're torn again. They have to go back again. And that's not going to be as good a result because now they have three or four months of poor tissue and it's going to be, it's just not going to be a very good result. So you have to be, once you're committed, you got to do, you have to do the plan, otherwise you don't have a good result. So reverse shoulder arthroplasty, like I said, it's just, it just one of the coolest things ever because you have this older person who can barely move, horrible pain, crunchiness in the shoulder, just horrible crepitance, et cetera, and a couple of days in the hospital, it's not fun, but we do have this um, uh, regional nerve blocks to make, help them with their pain while they're in the hospital and post-op. But by the time they come see me in two weeks, most patients, can, when they could not even move 45 degrees, they can move 90 degrees, 80 degrees. And they're fixing their hair and they're brushing their teeth. And they're, so a couple of weeks, they're very, very functional, a lot better than they were, they were before surgery. Very functional within four weeks. And again, all depends upon the patient and the, 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 how strong they were before, how much they pushed themselves. But it's just an absolute blessing, an absolute amazing sur uh, surgery. I mean, you want you don't want to get to this point if you can avoid it. You really want to have your, your own tissue. If you, but but if you're to that point where you're 70 years old and uh, you have horrible function or lack of function, this is just an amazing surgery. Um, but again. If I can tell anyone anything about shoulder, you start having pain that won't go away after a couple of weeks, for God's sakes, don't wait. I mean, you can avoid so much mystery, and we can get you hooked up with uh, physical therapy with your own program. Uh, you just need a little guidance. And someone says, well, I've been exercising and it still hurts. Well, then you're not doing the right exercises, or you need to do, have something else done. So, but that's, it's just, uh, again, like I said, I am I am very blessed to do what I do. Very blessed to work the people that I work with. We have a comprehensive uh, uh, situation at uh, Alabama Orthopedic Clinic where we have we have our ultrasound, MRI, X-rays, and continue to therapy. Uh, Surgery is downstairs in the same building, and everybody is on the same page just for for uh, to help to help the community. It's just it just I am I can't tell you how. How blessed I am to to do what I do where, where I work, and I think that's it. All right. If anyone has any questions, they can put them in the chat. But if anybody has any questions, they can add them into the chat. Or uh, if it is easier, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, yes, it was really, really great info. Thank you. I, will, I know I have a person in mind I will be recommending that they come talk to you because they've been <laughs> complaining about shoulder pain for a month or two. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but uh, perfect. Um, and we'll give it just a minute and see if anybody comes up with any questions. Uh, just as a reminder, for anybody that joined a little bit late, we will have a recording of the uh, of this presentation available on the internet after today. Um, and if anyone thinks of any questions after the fact, I'm sure that they can send them, uh, email them to myself or Sharon, and we can uh, pass them along. Um, in the meantime, I'll probably stop sharing the screen.
screen, but uh, thanks so much for the people that were able to join. I think we may have had a couple of people who had to drop off a little bit early, um, but uh, thanks for everyone who did join. And uh, if, yeah, hopefully uh, if you would like a copy of the presentation, you'll be able to find it on the internet. Uh, if you think of anything after the fact, feel free to email us. But otherwise, thanks everybody. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much.